Good morning, everybody. I'm Vinny Rash. I'm an ISA certified arborist. I have 32 years experience in the field. Um, and also I have a forestry year degree from West Virginia University. I know this is gonna be a lot of information in a short amount of time, so just pick up whatever you can and feel free to call me anytime. I'll give some cards out if anybody wants a card afterward. Um, we're gonna start with chainsaw maintenance. I'll use this small saw because it's easier to handle and I don't have to carry it all day. I do a lot of my work. This tower does 80% of my work doing big trees. Just because it's a small saw, it's easier to handle, easier to move around. But it doesn't mean it's any less dangerous. It just hits you just as fast and cuts you just as deep. Maintenance-wise, the biggest thing you want to do is always read your owner's manual. Always. It'll give you the basics. <laughs> and come on. Start with that. I know we're guys. We don't do that. Ladies, tell the guys, read their owner's manual. Another thing to do is use good quality gasoline. Use good quality mix oil. I, I like using the steel, the gray bottle. It's a synthetic. That it also sure. The gasoline that you use and not ethanol, or you um, it depends. I usually go through so much of it. I don't worry about it sitting around and having the ethanol in it. Right. Or I can use premium gas. Um, I yes, I use super. I use super and everything. Yeah. It, it, most saws. I know the steels usually recommend eighty nine or better, but I usually use the 90, 90 plus. And they also have products now, Mechanic in a Bottle and some other stuff that actually is a ethanol neutralizer, so to say, or it doesn't affect the gas as much. But I still like the steel synthetic. It is a, it has a stabilizer in it that helps already. And it's a full synthetic, so it doesn't break down like most oils do. And, and if you want to discount the day, it's John Deere Day at the Cayman River, and it's 10% off accessories. Nice. That'll help because that steel oil is probably, um, for a six pack, it's about 15 bucks. So it's not always cheaper, it's not always better. It'll get you in the long run. The all in all, it's pre mixed. And I, my wife's in the fire department and they use that as well, and that stuff still goes, as, goes bad on them as well because they're just not using it as often. But if you're using it more often, then sure, it's a great product. Why not use it? Um, good quality bar oil. Um, I recommend using bar oil, not just whatever oil you have laying around, motor oil, because it's very thin. It doesn't have a clinging quality that sticks to the bar in a chain. It just shoots right off or literally almost melts right off the bar. So don't just put anything in there. I know guys that have gotten in a pinch, sure, it'll work. You know, if you run out and you've got two cuts left, go ahead and throw some in there. but. Don't top it off with it, and then put some good bar oil on top of it. If you're hearing guys using transmission fluid or anything, whatever it takes. Another big thing is keeping your air filters clean. Some of them are paper, some of them are gonna be like a material that you blow out. Always keep these clean. This is gonna keep your oil clean. This is gonna keep, and having your oil clean is gonna keep your engines from wearing out faster. And I always blow them off. Try not to blow directly back into the filter. Always take the filter off and blow it from the inside out, or at least blow it on an angle so it's blowing it off and not directly into the, the pockets on there. And then while you're doing that on your saw, close your chokes. And that'll cl close the butterfly over your carburetor, not allow junk inside the carburetor, and you can also blow out that area. If you don't have one of these newer saws that covers all this stuff, a lot of the Husqvarna's and and then steel now, they have like a compression. Every five compression strokes, it actually pushes air back out. So they'll suck air and then it'll push and then suck and then push. And what it's doing is it's blowing all that loose debris back out of the carburetor area. So I can't get to my carburetor per se with this thing on here. But a lot of the older saws, even when I blow them out, I'll put my finger on them and just cover the hole just in case and then blow all that out. Another big thing about anything that you're going to use, that's sharp, a knife, a sword, whatever you'd use, chainsaws, keep them sharp. I don't care if you have a million dollar chainsaw, it is worthless if it's not sharp. It's much, more it, much more dangerous. Puts more effort on you, more strain on you, and definitely more potential to get hurt. So a sharp saw is the best thing. Um, another thing on having a saw, 
I always keep bar covers on them because these things will cut you even when they're not running. Steel finally made one that actually clips to the saw instead of when you pick it up, it just falls right off. I'm lucky enough, like in my other saw, my wife works as a firefighter, so she brings me all the old fire hose. They were great. They really do, and they last a long time. But they will have a tendency, a lot of the bigger saws have the mufflers out front, so they do have a tendency of getting a little hot and maybe even melting to the muffler. But it burns right off. Another thing about, other than keeping your bar or your chain sharp, is keeping it tensioned properly. Big thing on any saw is that it does not come completely off the bar. You do not want to see the entire tooth. I'll pull it up hard. You don't want to see the whole tooth when you just hang or pick it up or you see it hanging off the bar. That's a big tendency of jumping off the bar, which comes back and hits you. Another thing that helps you with that is this little piece of aluminum down here. It's called a chain grabber. This isn't just a waste of space or, you know, extra money. It actually will save your life. So when the chain, if it does come off the bar, it grabs this and usually thrashes them, breaks them, cuts them, but it doesn't destroy the chain and the chain doesn't hit you for five bucks. It's worth every penny. So keep an eye on those, replace those when needed. Keep your saw tense. Another thing you gotta, you gotta realize when you're doing these, when you're sharpening or tensioning your bar, you always wanna hold up the tip. Grab the tip of the bar and hold it up. If you let it down, you'll see it drop. I mean, a little bar will literally sit there up and down. Make sure it's all the way up, you keep it up. And start getting your tightens. Everybody has a little different. Every saw has a little different tightening. Some are on the front, some are on the side. You loosen up your main nut here, your retainer. Tension it up to where it's, like I said, you can just lift it for not get too much lift where it doesn't come com completely off. And then before I do my final tightening, I will literally spin it. Okay, great. I will literally spin it on the bar. You may be holding it up, spinning it, and then tightening it down. The thing you have to remember is when you do tighten some of these saws, it'll actually tighten it even more. That it'll get too tight to where you can't freely turn it with your hand. If it's not freely turning with your hand, then actually you are grinding your bar. And yeah, it'll wear it out. You'll actually get a groove in it. And then, then the bar will actually start to open up and literally fold over and create a lip. So when you start cutting, you might get a hook where it'll just drag as it's going down through the wood because the bar is actually extending past the chain. So any questions on that? Um, the only time I loosen it up is if I'm, it's late in the day, I've been using the saw all day and I have to tighten it because as it gets hot, the chain will stretch and as it cools off, it'll contract again. So if you run it really hot and everything's hot, the bar's hot, the chain's hot, then you really tighten it down and then put it away, that chain can actually constrict and split your bar. A lot of times on some of these, on the bars, you'll actually, there's a tool it has multiple purposes, also for sharpening. It'll take your depth gauge down, but also using it for cleaning out the bar, and sometimes just used for measuring the bar to slip it in there to make sure that there's not a lot of gap where the bar can, the chain will literally slop back and forth in that groove. and just doesn't give you a nice clean cut that you guys are looking for. I noticed you have the bar upside down, something that I do as well. But also, as the chain runs, it wears that groove. It will. Flat file. Clean the Absolutely. I'll take my flat file and, and, and just scrape it. I'll just come down the edge of the bar, say this is my bar. I will literally come on the edge and just run it down and scrape off. I don't know if this will come up sometime in my talk, but as you're cutting, it's okay to rock the saw back and forth as opposed to just letting it come straight down. And by rocking it back and forth, you're cutting a smaller surface area, which doesn't bog the saw down and cuts a lot quicker with less strain and wear and tear on the saw and its components. So to be able to cut through and just rock it and then bring it back, you're just not cutting the entire piece of wood at once. You're cutting parts of it as you go through. Unfortunately, by doing so, and if your saw is not perfect, the bar is not perfect, the chain's not perfect, you're gonna have that stuff where you're gonna have to sand down because you're gonna you're be able to see all the saw marks when you do that. I'm sure everybody's experienced with it. 
Go ahead. It wasn't spinning at all. Because you had that much debris packed up in there. Probably that you're cutting, since you're cutting a piece of wood that big, as opposed to doing the back and forth where you're taking, you know, say half of it in each cut, it's allowing it to clear instead of packing up. So yeah, and it's it's wet. It's another one that's gonna things are gonna cling or small debris. I use the air compressor with everything. Uh, the tip. Zip, zip, zip. Yeah, some of them do have a little hole there for a grease, a little grease gun. I don't have those. These are all sealed bearings, so I don't worry about them. So they usually get about a year or so out of a bar. Um, this one down here, amazingly, this saw was, uh, it was brought two days before my daughter was born. It was right before Hurricane Isabel hit. And I came all the way home from work from Northern Virginia, and I didn't bring a saw with me as my wife was pregnant, and the hurricane hit, so I ran out to the local shop, and I paid too much money for that saw, but that was in 2000, and she's 2003. So this saw, believe it or not, is 16 years old, and it's still 440. This is a 44. I guess now they're 440s. That was another thing that Steel threw me off with. All their old saws, everything that had an even number was professional grade. Everything that had an odd number, like the 019s, 029s, they were all homeowner saws. Now they threw a wrench in it, and, and it's almost opposite. If you're looking at the last number, then it's opposite. And this is and now this one is, these saws are now MS441s. So, and the saw went from, this used to be 450 bucks. This has always been, this thing was, $525 for 20 years. And now this saw jumped to 675. This one was 450 and now they're almost a thousand. And I don't I don't know what they did to make it a thousand dollar saw other than change the price. But they're still a great saw and this is my go-to for big wood. Like I said, this is, does 80% of my work and this does the trunk. So but even with the small saw, still use two hands. I found out the hard way. And I hit myself with it and wound up getting 13 stitches, luckily. And I say luckily, 13 stitches was pretty mild for burying the saw in my arm. And I did that working over a power line. And the boss never called the power company, would call the power company, but they removed the line. But no one called the cable company, Fios, or the telephone company to remove their lines going through the same tree. So I was picking branches up and cutting at the same time. And I wound up hitting a, a branch on a holly tree about the size of a pencil. And sure enough, it hit the no zone and shot it right back in my arm. I was able to turn it, and it just got me three times. And it felt like just a little pinch. That's all. You won't even notice. But I was lucky. They do. They do. They do. It just, it's, it's more comfortable. It's more commonplace to have that where this is having your both hands right here. So for arborists, we have a tendency of one-handing everything and or holding it and tossing it as opposed to roping every twig. Not anymore. I'm lazy for that. You know, I got spoiled in a box for 15 years. And now I'm, I'm basically doing consulting and landscaping. Yeah, I, I figured the older I get, they say the older you get and less incidents you've had, your odds are against you. So I figured that 13 stitches and, you know, I've actually done more damage with my hand saw and my hand pruners than I've, than I've done with a chainsaw. But it, I've seen guys that it doesn't take much. One of my guys one day, decided, I'm, as I'm yelling at him to stop cutting near his face, because he's right there on the tree, cutting by his face, and I'm yelling at him, he puts his hand here, and sure enough, the saw kicks back, boom. Hits his hand, comes right across his thumb. The artery got hit, and it was a mess. It was a mess. He couldn't even move his thumb. They had to reattach the tendon that he cut, you know, and then put some kind of finger spreader on there where every so many days he'd have to crank this thing just to you know, stretch that tendon back out. It's not pretty. So take your time. Take that extra couple minutes and do it right as opposed to killing yourself. 
It's not worth it. On your saw with maintenance, another big thing is every time before you clean and open these caps to fill them up, get an old paintbrush and just brush stuff around them. Especially with the newer caps, the older ones used to be like recessed and it was really nice. You could take them off and had a lip there inside the cap where nothing fell into it. Now with these new caps, everything gangs up right here and you can't clean anything. So as soon as you go to move the cap, everything drops right into the saw. So go buy a cheap paintbrush for 99 cents and just brush them off the best you can and then wipe them down, especially afterward. You want to get all the excess oil out of that area because this is going to leak all over the saw and it's going to, everything's going to cling to it. And by all that clinging to it, in our cleaning process, all these things are breathers. Everything on here is a vent. It either breathes in or pushes hot air out as, a, as the motor runs. So the more goo you get on your saw, the more dirt and everything's going to collect to it. It's going to keep your saw running hotter and it's going to burn them up faster. This is air cooled. You got to get air to them. Um, like I was saying, always check your bar for wear, check for lips, um, check for the clog oiler holes, and make sure it's straight. If it's not cutting straight, you'll know quick, because especially if you get into a big piece of wood. You might get away with a small piece of wood, but when you start burying the whole bar on that, you'll know quick whether it's not cutting right. It, it's either going to bind or it's going to start to hook one way or another. And last. Sorry. wedge or try to pick up on it. Big thing is try not to get it wedged. I've had, well, I always have at least two saws, so I've even had some get pinched. It happens, especially on storm damaged trees and when the tree's up there just hanging there, it's not a big deal. But when it's on the ground, there's a lot of tension wood on stuff and you start, that's when you get your, your pinches and all that. And our president was one of them, mine was one of them, and uh, yeah, it happens. we had another chainsaw. So bring in the other one and then take the tension off of it, cutting on each side of it, and it'll find it eventually loosen up. Or another thing is, try to put the wedge in there before it gets pinched, because there might not be any room. If you got this, the bars half pinched in it, you're not going to have a way to get a, a wedge stuck in behind there and open it up. Awesome. Well, some of the cuts, I guess I can jump onto that. We'll, we'll get to that. Any other questions on maintenance? Tuning and all that stuff, it's really getting technical nowadays, and they actually have little computers they hook into the saws to tune them. Some of them you cannot tune by hearing it anymore. A lot of us used to just go by listening to the saw and hearing if it's fully screaming or whether it's one and out or whether it's bogging down and then adjust from there. Now, if you don't use these little, I guess, tachometers that they have, you're, you could do damage to your saw. You're running in too lean. Another thing is the, the oil in your saw, when you do your mixes, they do say, in the bottle, say, use, you know, two and a half gallons of gas per bottle. I usually go a little less. I'd rather it run a little rich and, and, and smoke a little if it needs to, as opposed to running lean and, and and burning the saw up, burning that cylinder up. The one key thing, uh, chain break, and I noticed that, that was in my safety dog. A lot of people, and we usually, you know, we go out and we got like six people with chainsaws, so that's dangerous to start with. But you'll see without the break on, and some people still have chainsaws that don't have chain breaks, it's freewheeling. It should not freewheel mm -hmm. ever. No. And if it does freewheel, every time you stop cutting, set your brake. That's what they're meant for. My father never used a chain brake. He would even take these things off, saying they were getting in his way. No, leave it on there. It'll save your life, especially in a kickback situation, because it's meant to, as soon as you get that kickback, it's, it's naturally going to come at you. This is in the safety talk, so we'll just jump, we'll, we'll wait for that, and we'll jump into that. <coughs> Safety-wise. Equipment, chaps, chaps. Anytime you pick up a saw to use it and you are not in a tree, put your chaps on. 
the majority of injuries in tree work are going to be your legs and your arms. Your legs because that's where the saw is, and your arms because you're using it with one hand. Put on your chaps every single time. Helmet. I know everybody feels goofy wearing one. It will save your life. I wish I had the, the demonstration that I saw when I was younger. There's a guy had a cantaloupe. He took a hammer and pow, pops right through that cantaloupe. And then puts a new one down there, puts a helmet on it, hits his helmet, takes it off. Cantaloupe's still 100%. Put this thing on. And really, helmets should be replaced every so many years. Obviously, I haven't done mine in a while. But usually the big thing is if your helmet takes a hit, if you have something fall on your head one time, get rid of it. It's worth 45 bucks to go get a new one. And it doesn't help you sitting in the truck. It has to be on your head. Another thing with the headgear, um, I just put my earplugs in because I can't get a headset over these. I used to wear one of the big helmets with the headset and the face screen and all that, and it just got too bulky and cumbersome. And I like the ventilated helmets, especially on hot days, because you're not overheating between the chaps, long pants, the helmet. You know, heat exhaustion is still another concern. And I've even talked to a lot of people when they write these OSHA regulations and saying that, you know, with all this gear on, we're, we're more in tune of having heat exhaustion than we are hitting ourselves with a chainsaw. But they don't want to hear that. Um, so use that stuff. Gloves, good steady pair of gloves. Some people even use padded palms, help reduce the vibration, and, and it'll help on arthritis and stuff like that when we get older. Lord knows that I'm getting older and I'm starting to feel that from not doing it. Hearing protection, these will work, but it is better to have an ear muff because yes, it blocks, the plugs block here, the ear muff, you're still losing hearing all around your ear. Anything that vibrates around your ear will, will increase the chance of you losing your hearing. So an ear muff is better, but something is better than nothing. And when I was in a tree, you can't be in a tree with the big mask and all that stuff. It just doesn't work. I would use those on the ground making big cuts and say the wind's blowing in my face and, or there's a slope and you have one place to stand and you just got to eat it. You just got to take it. And even with glasses on, another one, safety glasses, not just sunglasses. They have to be an OSHA approved glass. They will actually take almost like a, I think they rate them as a 22 caliber bullet can hit these glasses at a certain distance and not break them. Whereas sunglasses, I'm going right through them. So, and they're 10 bucks. They're probably cheaper than regular sunglasses. So wear them. They even make clears. They have the ambers, but I just, uh, I'm light sensitive, so I always wear those. But they have to be on or they're worthless. Gloves. They have um, kind of like a goggle, or like you say, like a safety glass that will go over top of them. Sure. And even some. They're talking almost a quart now, a quart an hour. And that's a lot. Sure. Sure. Exhaustion, anything, gets you loopy. And that's when you get hurt. It's like working later in the day or not eating and you start running low on energy and that's when you're going to get hurt. You're pushing yourself, you're trying to get the job done. Tree men don't have a nine to five job. We have a nine to whenever the job's done. So, you know, if you need to stop, take a break, get some snacks, get some water, bring that stuff with you. I would go through a five gallon jug on my truck every day with a four man crew. And we, you know, and then still we'd bring Gatorades and stuff and still every day we're filling that water jug and going through it. So it was always keeping on them. Don't just drink Gatorade, don't drink, this doesn't look like the energy drink crowd, but I have guys that, I, I'll tell you it's, it's an honest story, um, one of my climbers, 35 years old, he literally woke up in the morning drinking coffee all day and then switched to Red Bulls and then at night would drink alcohol, he died of a heart attack two days after Christmas this year. 35 years old. So hydration is, is huge. Good, clean water. Any of ours, but uh, they recommend.
You do. And it's like a lot of things. You don't realize it's, it's going bad or worn out until you change it. A lot of times we'll sit there with these files because they're selling at the stores now. I've seen these files at your local store for $5 a file. So you try to use it as much as you can, and you're like, why is it taking me 90 strokes to get this thing? And you put a new one on, it's like, done. So is your time worth more than, you know, if, if, I'm, if I'm losing time sharpening my saw, if I'm sharpening a saw for an hour, well, I could, could lose up to $300 professionally being out in the field with a crew. Or just swapping a chain out. It might be quicker than, and then going home and sharpening it later. Um, properly match your saw to the job and to the operator. Don't use this saw to fell a 20 inch diameter tree. Don't use this saw to prune your bushes. <laughs> Believe me, I've seen it all. I've heard it all. Don't do it. I had a guy I had a hedge trimmer one time. Two hedge trimmers on a job. One's the extended one. The other one's a short one. The guy using the short one, for some reason, is trying to do everything up top. The guy with the long one's doing everything down low. Don't ask me why. It's just the nature of the beast. So the guy that had one over his head, he's holding the handle. Instead of holding the side handle and the, the trigger handle, he's holding this one, trying to reach as high as he can. And he loses it. It goes to fall, and he goes to grab it. Didn't take him off, but it wasn't pretty. It's just using the right tool for the job. So match it up. If you don't have a lot of experience, you don't, want to, you don't need to go out and buy an 066 with a 32 inch bar to start out with. You know, stick with a nice 16, 18 inch bar, work up the skills, and everything takes time. You can read as many books as you want, but it doesn't help if you don't have that hands-on experience. All right, before we even get started, before you even start your saw, for when your safety gear goes on. Next, we're going to see, make sure our, our saw is sharp. And you're looking for a good proper angle, which you're, they will come out of the box, depending on what you get. If you get a chip chain, which is usually used for softer wood, it'll be at a 45 degree angle. And if you use a chisel chain, it'll be at a 30 degree angle, and that's for harder wood. So it's just going to take a smaller bite. On harder wood, you're going to need a smaller bite. On that softwood, pines, poplar, stuff like that, go with the chip and just rip it through. Or you just go with a semi-chisel and it'll do basically everything. So I usually keep mine at a 30 degree angle and keeping them sharp. And the biggest thing is making sure that this point here is sharp. All it takes is one rock, one piece of dirt, and that curls that thing up and then your saw is not cutting like it should be. Very bad. Make sure your chain is tight and tightened properly. And before you start it, make sure your chain break is on. Push it forward. And before you start cutting, another thing is clear the area of, of, of brush, debris, hazards, kids, dogs, anything. You just never know what's going to be out there. Before I get into a tree, the first thing I do is go up to it, hit it with a hammer. When it's and it's hollow, you'll hear this, this dull thud. And then when it's solid, you'll hear just, boom, you'll hear a hard thud. I wish I had some stuff we could tell the difference. But you can literally hear like a dull drum sound when it's hollow. So you want to make sure that the tree is sound. Having your helmet on is another one. Look for hazards, look for power lines, look for beehives. You, you just never know what you're going to find. And with dead branches. A two inch branch will give you a headache. A four inch branch will split your skull in two. That's all it takes. A four inch branch will go through your helmet. It could even go through your helmet and still hit you in the head at the right angle. I had a guy had a helmet on, a, a, a stub was cut out of the tree. It bounced around the tree like a pinball machine, came down, took his ear muff off, and took his earlobe right off. That quick. And it was just a stub this big. Four inches in diameter. So two inches will give you a headache. Four inches will kill you. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just trying to let you guys know that it doesn't take much. Two seconds and you're hurt. Um, clear in the area. Make sure your brake operates properly. 
that's having that on, squeeze the trigger, and if it moves at all, you need time to replace your sprocket and change your brake. It should not move at any reason. Even if it is at full RPM, it comes forward, it stops it instantly. Don't worry about hurting the saw. The saw you can fix when you cut your leg off or hit yourself. That's going to take a lot longer and be a lot more expensive. Use your safety equipment. Use both hands. Here's a stat for you. 75% less likely for an accident if you use both hands at the same time and with your gear. 75%. That's a big time. That's not a small number. Hand positioning. Your hand is always going to be fully on the, on the handle with your thumb opposite your fingers. Not along it, not up front with it, because this can jump right out at you. Especially guys that don't have their safety brake, or even some of the older saws, they have this handle here, but it wasn't a safety brake. It was basically, in case the chain jumped off, it came back at the handle. Or if they bundle up underneath, that's where this one's for. Because if not, before they put these on there, the chain blade could slap all the way around and come back and grab you. Especially in your groin area where you're looking at arteries and, and other vitals that you probably want still. And a good firm grip. Hold that saw. Another one is when you're cutting, you want your left arm almost in a locked out straight position. Because that way you can keep it locked out. When If it jumps, it can come up or it's going to go down. You don't want it to have this bend. You don't want to be here and have it go wherever. There's no control when your arms are bent. So you want that one out there good, straight, locked. It doesn't have to be completely straight where you're out here, but you want a good, good firm grip and you want a good brace on your left arm. If you're lefties and you're doing it opposite, no good. You're just never going to get that. You're just going to have to work. You have to use it right-handed. Foot positioning. You're standing there cutting, you want your feet to at least be shoulders width apart. You don't want to be standing here and you lose your balance, you fall on your own saw, or in case you've got to run. You want to be able to, get, be able to move around quickly and keep your knees slightly bent, feet apart, feet bent. And you also do never want to be standing directly over the saw or directly behind the saw. So if something happens, you're in that area. You want to be off to the side as much as possible, whenever possible. So if something happens, it's coming here or going there and not coming here or coming there. Not pretty. Any questions on that so far? It's good to be repeated. Well, there's a lot of young people don't have it either. Someone was looking out for you. Yeah, but whatever time it takes to get the uh, nice. equipment on, it's worth every second of it. Because had I had my chaps on, the other thing that uh, made you come to cover is don't load the saw. Don't go, oh, you know, in the saw. Don't force it. Keep it at the highest RPM you possibly can. And that with 440, it's not supposed to have over a 28 inch bar on it. Well, Steele says you can drop it to 32 or even a 36. It's not enough so saw. Like, yeah, it's not enough saw. I got a 32 on my, my 440, and um, it works great. But you don't, if you lug it, you're going to kill the saw and you'll be buying a new one. Yeah. yeah, it can be done if you're just wearing it out faster. When you start getting into that 32, that's when I jumped up to 066. Sure. Sure, you get the occasional. Never use the saw over your shoulders. Never over your head. And never on a ladder. Ever. 
I get a lot of those horror stories where my husband was cutting on a ladder. He cut the branch, it came back, and swiped him off the ladder. And then he fell on his chainsaw. So don't, don't use a ladder. That's when you call in somebody, an arborist, or somebody to come do it properly. It's, it, might, it might sound expensive paying that guy, but it's not expensive after you get hurt. I had another guy we did work at the homeowner association. He decided he wanted to climb a ladder, lean back of the ladder, because he had a Bradford pair that had a little branch that was rubbing his screen, and he said it just annoyed him. I'm in his neighborhood once every two weeks, take it, working for the HOA, and he was the president. So I go see him. He's got both arms are broken. Both forearms are broken. I said, what happened? He goes, I fell off my ladder. I said, doing what? He goes, pruning my tree. I said, Bob, I'm in here every two weeks. As much work have you thrown me? I could have clipped that for nothing. Instead, you do it yourself and break your arm. Or the other guy that my wife had the horrible one where he had to, he gotten up on his roof, he tied a rope to his car, climbed up on the roof, and tied himself to the rope with the car. And now he's pruning. His wife goes and gets in the car, <laughs> drives to town. Literally pulled him over the roof, dropped him in the driveway, and then drove three miles into town before someone stopped him and said, you're dragging somebody behind you. It was her husband. Not pretty. He didn't make it. I'm hoping he died the second he hit his driveway. The second he fell off the roof is what I think. I don't want to hope that on anybody, but I'd rather him die right then than get dragged three miles and die halfway into town. Maybe she wanted that. I don't know. Some days are better than others. We've all had those moments. Right? A lift. True, true. But they can be just as dangerous if you're not experienced and you drop a branch on that lift and you go down with the lift. Even with a bucket truck, too big of a branch, they only have a 300 pound max. And I've heard guys using that bucket, because the bottom part of the boom is metal. The other part is fiberglass. It helps cut down on the electricity, the, the dielectric. So it has a 300 pound weight limit. And guys were like lifting logs with that while standing in it, and it breaks the boom and dumps them on their head. Or they're in that bucket and they don't have their safety belt on. Sure. And they tip over. Scary. And scary. scary. And a lot of guys that don't have their belts on also have been bounced out of the bucket where the branch comes down and hits the bucket and loads it up and then shoo, when it releases, shoo, the guy literally gets thrown out of the bucket. Even if you have your belt on, you might get thrown out of the bucket, but at least you're going to hang there. And that's why they say... Yes, it's worth the extra thirteen dollars or whatever it is. Bonded, you don't have to be bonded. Is usually when people go inside the house, but insured, yes, liability and workman's comp. Because if you don't have that, and somebody gets hurt on your property, they can come after the homeowner. I've even called my insurance company on that one for a roof, and they're like, "It's fine, it's on him." I'm like, "No, nah, I don't like that. I don't like it." The moral of my story. Um, yeah, like I said, it might be a little more expensive, but what's your life worth to you? Another part on cutting, where are we going here? We can gauge. Oh, this is where you start your cut, full rev. Go into the wood, full rev. Don't slap it. It's nice and easy, but go full rev. And then when you get down to just about finishing your cut, 
I usually pump the gas and kind of come off easy. Just in case the wood binds or pinches you, it's not throwing it. You can be in more control. We already did the locking your arm brace. This is the danger part of every chainsaw. Here to here. This part of the tip, this is the no-go zone. This is where this is coming around. It's going to just barely grab something, but not cut it nicely. And that's the kickback. No chain break. No chain break. And uh, the blade went halfway through the log and popped it back and it came out of my hand and cut the thing right there. It doesn't take long at all. But Not bad, but plunge cut. Plunge cut, you start here. And that's an expert cut. And that's where you're going to start cutting with the tip. Start your cut, and then you bring it up and then shove it in. But you're not going to do it this way. You're not going to hit this. You don't want to hit the top portion of that. This is what you do with your plunge cut. And you're just going to put the tip on it, bring it up, and then drive it straight in. Another one you got to have a sharp saw, and that's something I would not recommend for a beginner to try. Um, a lot of in the, in the when we get to felling, we'll talk about another one that you might want to learn. Anything on safety while well, we're clearing that out? Go ahead. Safety on starting or saw? Starting. I had that on my list. Um, they don't recommend drop pull. They don't recommend. On, the, on these smaller saws, I do it, but you still, if you put the chain brake on, I slide with that. This is one of those things where they don't want you to, but how am I going to, yeah, how am I going to, you know, the, the correct way of doing it is to put your foot on the ground, put your foot here, put your hand there, start it. I can't do that with this. No handle. So I have to one hand this one. And that's why I always put the chain brake on, always keep it off to the side so it's not here coming at you, that you're, nobody's around you, that you're hitting them or throwing them. That's another one. They're saying it's an advanced <laughs> technique. And you put it here, you know, get everything ready, and then cross over, start it up. I, I still do a drop. I do a drop. But I always put the chain brake on, and then I'm just dropping it. But it's just, you said. Even that's not turning. You can still throw it and hit yourself. But... But in a tree, too, I can't put my foot on it. Or in a bucket, I can't put a foot on it. i, I got to do the drop. So I do it more often than I'd like to, but at this point in the stage, I have never hurt myself starting a saw. Felling. Grab my kid's soccer clipboard so don't laugh at me too hard when you guys see the soccer field in the back of it. <laughs> You're going to have three different types of notches. Here's a tree. Your first one is going to be your standard notch. That's going to be flat across the bottom, and then a 45 degree angle coming back to that. You do not want this notch to go deeper than one third, one quarter to one third of the depth, because you want to have holding wood here at the end of this cut. This is the standard. Another one is called the Humboldt which is basically taking the standard and doing the flat on the top and doing your notch on the bottom. And that's usually for more sloped areas, so when the wood comes down, it's not going to change the difference. These are still about 45 degrees. But the one they're recommending now is going to be an open face notch, where you're going to have almost a 70 degree angle with a, a less of a notch, less depth, and you're going to start a lot bigger and come all the way, almost like that. And the purpose of that notch is, you guys have all probably made smaller notches. And as soon as that notch closes up, that tree has a tendency of barber chairing. 
or kicking back off the stump. That's what you're trying to avoid. When I, does, anybody, does everybody know what a barber chair is? Barber chair is when you, when the tree starts to go and it hits that notch, the back part of the tree breaks out because it has so much force and so much pressure in there that, that it has to go somewhere. So it breaks. And if you're standing behind that tree, it'll throw you into the neighbor's yard while crushing your head at the same time. So you always want to stay off to the side of everything, not directly behind or in front of. So I still use these pretty often, but I just make them a little taller instead of having this really long stretched out because it's a hard, long cut and it wears. I don't want to wear my chain out that fast, that early in the cut. So, but this is the safest because it's so big. Anybody have any questions on notches or, I know I'm not explaining it as well as I could, but say, there's no set size of the notch, but the bigger is better. What you don't want to do is think that deeper is better. Deeper is not better. Deeper is when you lose control of your felling. Usually if you, if you have to move from one side of the tree to the other with the same saw, if you've got a 30 inch diameter tree and you've got a 16 inch saw, you're probably getting there. You should be upping the size of that because you're just not making a fast enough cut or this thing can break out before you have a chance to even really cut it. So I would wait or hire somebody just to have a bigger saw or get one of your buddies that has a bigger saw and experience to come in and do it properly. Can you do it? Sure. Done it all the time. I've even had with that 32 inch bar, I still had 48 inch piece of wood that I had to go from one side to the other. And the scariest is being in the tree with an 066 and a 32 inch bar while the crane's plucking out, you know, a 5,000 pound piece of wood over top of your head. And you have no place to go because you're strapped to the tree standing there. It's not fun. But I'd rather be a clean, quick cut than a slow, dirty cut where I'm stuck, strapped to the tree or within an area where I can't make a run for it. Also on felling, I know we're going to skip a lot of that. We're doing straight to these cuts. But we'll go back and clean that up. So, too far. So how deep should your notch be? Very good. And you want at least a minimum of like five, five to ten inches the size of the, the opening of your notch. You don't want to have this little baby skinny notch. You don't want to have that. Because that's going to close up so quick and force this thing. And usually when these things start to go, this whole piece will split right up here and that's when that barber chair comes back at you. So what we're using now is the open face notch which it allows for a little more slop. And it makes it bigger. The slop being, you also, when you make your back cut, you at least want to be level. You never want to be below it. I always try to go, depending on the size of the tree, at least an inch or two above. This is what we're looking for, this cut. So you still have that. The reason for the notch is there's still weight coming straight down on that tree. And you've opened up this notch. So now that tree is not, there's no longer there to support that weight. So the tree naturally wants to lean into that notch, especially a straight up and down tree. Now granted, if this tree is leaning backward and you put a notch on that side and you think it's gonna go that way, I got news for you, it's not gonna go that way. So it gives you a little bit of slop. And then right there at the end, you wanna have your last two inches you don't want to cut through that. This is what we call the holding wood or hinge wood. This is another one that's going to save your life. Because if you cut all the way through this thing, when it has a tendency of starting to fall, now that weight is not coming straight down. When it starts to fall, now the weight wants to kick back. So if you cut through all the way through your notch, this thing can literally jump back off the stump and come back at you while you're cutting. So you want to have that hinge wood 
If it still doesn't go because of your hinge wood or because you, you know, wedge, plastic wedge. Don't use metal wedges because that'll dull your bar and then you're stuck. And literally, if your saw can't cut and you've you got this thing hanging there, standing there, one good wind can blow it over at this point. So make sure you put a plastic one in there because even if you hit them, big deal. You see a couple of nicks in here. I've got ones that are all messed up. I'll even put them on a grinder and keep reusing them until there's nothing left. But they're only a couple dollars and it's still cheaper than replacing your chain or having a dangerous cut. I've never do that. No. No, I don't like those. I've never heard of any any at any of my arborist conventions or anything like that. No one's ever recommended that. I don't know if it was an older thing. I would have to hear why what their reasoning was behind that. But I've never heard anybody in my stuff talking about that. So you're talking about I'll just show everybody else. They were using their first the standard notch. Okay. So you're saying they want their, instead of my cut would be here, you're talking about they're coming from here and coming back down. The only reason to do that is it's less likely to pinch in that situation. Less likely to bounce back too, wouldn't it? Well, that's why you do it up a little bit instead of level, because when this starts to go and it's coming back, you still have this piece of wood here, because you still have that inch where this notch is going to come back and catch into there. As opposed to, we're, and, but it's going to make that that trunk jump when it closes in that notch. That back piece is going to bounce. Sometimes you can use that. I've used that notch to actually bounce and jump over plants that are surrounded around the tree. And some of them I don't want to go that far. Well, I'll do the opposite, where I do the opposite notch, the Humboldt notch, where it slides into that and then slides off to where I keep it close. It might save me a couple feet from hitting something that the, the, the crown's going to hit. At one point when I was doing that every day, I literally got to the point where we would do stuff. We would go out in the yard and mark. We'd take our water balls or something like that, stick them in the yard and say, where's the tree going to finish up? I had one so close one time where it literally, it took the wrapper off my Gatorade bottle and left the Gatorade bottle sitting there. I got to the point where I could stand out and walk back from the tree and tell you where it was going to hit or where I wanted it to land. So wedges are definitely a good thing. Have you ever used a bottle jack? I haven't gotten that big. I haven't gotten that big. Another one I'm going to scare you about is when you start cutting into a tree and realize it's hollow, you have no hinge wood. It's gone. That's when it starts getting scary. It's, you're going to have to, at that point, notches and, and wedges really don't work. If it's that rotten, this thing's going to wedge in there, and literally, you're going to just compress the wood fiber, and it's not even going to lift the tree. That's when you need to have a professional come in, or at least get a rope in the tree. And I'm not talking 20 feet. If you got a 100-foot tree, and you put that rope 20 feet, <laughs> you have no advantage at all. At all. Yeah. You have no advantage. <laughs> so definitely, the higher that rope, the better. Um, where else do we want to go? Go ahead. Well, you usually hits that before it, oh shit, and it's going the wrong way, your ball will pinch. Yeah. So usually when it's, that's where we're going to talk about the plunge cut. Here's another one that they do. Say so you do your regular open face. We're going to go with the regular, because I'm going to say, I'm going to say regular, it's not a standard. There's your notch. Okay. Where are we going with that? Um... What was your question again? Plunge cut. So, so what they do on these is you'll start your cut. Instead of coming back here to start your back cut, they'll do that plunge cut right at that two-inch mark where they want to keep their hinge wood. They'll do their plunge cut, come straight through it, push it all the way through the tree, making sure you keep two inches the entire area. You don't want to just, on that plunge, say we're... <laughs> and the hopes is you're trying to get you're trying to have at least 
by putting your notch, you want to have at least 80% of the tree left from here to here. If you get too deep into it, that's when you're going to lose your hinge wood. So say this is going to be 20 inches of the tree, or 20% of the diameter. So you want to keep that hinge wood there. With that plunge cut, you're going to start here and then work your way back. So it's going to leave this piece of wood here to be your holding wood now. So then right at the last, it's going to make it a quicker cut. It's going to fell quicker once you get to that point. See, at this point, this is holding it. That's holding it. You can walk away and do whatever you want. Where the other way, if you start this way and cut into that point, and something happens, this is the only piece holding it. And it's hinging. So this is actually the safer cut. It's just we don't recommend it for homeowners because you're doing a plunge cut. But you can't do your wedges like that either. Um, no. But you well, you can. You can actually put your wedges after you come back and start working your way back, you can put your wedges on the side. side. Yeah, you can you can put your wedges like on this area and then just have that final cut to make where you're cutting the hinge for it. Any questions? And then to do your last piece. Or you pull it out and you tell everybody, get ready to pull, get ready to run. Another thing is having a escape route before you need an escape route. Look around, clear the brush, make sure you have a place to go. It doesn't take much, but it, it's, and you think it's common sense. But a lot of guys, I've even had them on my cruise where they're pulling the tree and they're standing there. And you gotta like grab them and drag them out or Push them to the side to say, it's coming your way. I had a guy, he backed up, he's pulling the rope, he backs up and hit a bush and knocks his hat off. He goes down to pick up his hat and this tree came down and right by his head, bam, hit the ground standing right next to him. He goes, I felt the wind of the tree move my hair and come by my head. I was like, all that for a hat. I was like, you didn't even have your helmet on, you had a hat. Not that a helmet would have done anything. That would have busted his skull like a, a baseball bat hitting a tomato. There was a man in our neighborhood. He was killed because they uh, cut a dead tree down for firewood. And the top of the tree hit another tree and a big branch fell down and hit him on the head. Well, so another, my rule at home is if I'm going to cut out a tree, Watching, so there are two of them. Sure. Whenever you can do that. So going out in the woods all by yourself. No one can help you. No one will even know. We're not professionals. Oh, even for professionals, you shouldn't be out there by yourself. Yeah, not all the way hang ups. Hang ups. That's a, that could be a long topic. Um, usually, if it gets hung up, what we do, what I do, is called a West Virginia walk down. It was where I try to put a rope in it, one way or another, so I can control its drop. But if not, say it tips over, it hangs up on something. So I make a backside notch, and then I start coming through here. And what it's going to do is keep falling in to this spot to where it's going to stand up. It's nice to have a rope in a tree. Maybe you can pull it from there. The problem is, if you wanted it to fall that way, and now it's hung up, it's not going to fall that way. It's going to come back the opposite way. So, I like trying to get a rope in it. What I would do is, especially if the tree is big enough, obviously big enough to hold it, to hold it up, it would hopefully be big enough to put a line over this tree and then hang it. Get it wrapped, get it tied onto there, and then when as I'm cutting it to the point where I cut the bottom out of the tree, it's now hanging there. And then I can go to my lowering device and just basically lower it down and take pieces as I'm lowering it and then drop it some more, you know, just keep cutting to where I can handle it. It's the most dangerous. That's the least, that's my least favorite cut to make because I'm right there with it. And it's, you know, it's just going to keep standing up and it makes it more dangerous because you don't know where it's going to go after that. And any time it can slide out, at any time the branch that it's pinching can break out and you just got to be ready to run. I'm sorry I missed you earlier. Go ahead.
Well, I mean, for, for probably 90% of homeowners, electric chainsaw is all they need for the occasional broken branch, the occasional, you know, nipping some bushes or something out. That's not a, that's not a problem. The big thing with that is just watch the cord. I mean, we all had, the, I don't know, you guys. Wood turners use electric, so they can use it inside. They use it inside as well. Yeah, They're quiet. A lot of steel and Husqvarna are now making battery saws. Yes, they are expensive. The battery saws are light, very light comparatively. Probably, probably. I know guys that love the Huskies. I'm, I'm a steel guy myself, but I've, I've seen and used a couple Huskies, and some guys are telling me they can do pruning all day on two batteries. So my one's charging in the truck, the other one's in their saw. What they like about them, like you say, you can use them inside. I've had trees where, you know, they fall in a house, a branch goes through the roof, a punched a hole through the master bedroom bed, and I'm standing on their bed, my heart's breaking because now I'm about to fire up this chainsaw in somebody's house and shoot wood chips all over their master bedroom, but what else can you do? And then not only I'm, you know, smoke, oil, you know, the fumes from the exhaust, everything was, it was just, it's heartbreaking. And some guys like them because now they can start jobs at six or seven o'clock, eight o'clock in the morning where they're not, you know, interfering with the noise barrier. Another one is when you're a climber and it's nice to just, just it's running as opposed to sitting there trying to get that thing fired up. A lot of guys won't even, I always started my saws on the ground or have one of the guys on the ground say, start my saw, run it, let it warm up. So that way when I get up in the tree, it means you to start. Some guys, or sometimes so I'm in a bad spot, I can't start a saw. Or if I'm trying to start that big one in the tree, it's tough, it's tough. So I'll start them on the ground, set the chain break, and then bring them up running. Yeah, that's that's no bueno. I, I I get that. For the for the reason that I can go out to the shed any time, day or night. Sure. For a couple quick cuts, they're yeah. they're. I have no problem with them. I mean, whatever works for you. I just know that I I can't use that. I can't drag an entire extension cord over the yard. And that's like uh, hedge trimmers. It became the same way. I mean, how many of you guys? Use the old electric hedge trimmers, and how many electrical cords or extension cords did you cut? <laughs> I mean, constantly. You're constantly nipping them, cutting them, repairing them, throwing them away. And my dad even cut his hand one time, just trying to move the electrical cord. And like he would, he would always sling them behind him. And when he did that, he had the, he was holding the hedge trimmer here, and he would slung his hand behind it, and he hit the blade on the, the hedge trimmer. So he's one of those. Any other questions? I don't know if I covered that as well as I could have. I was kind of pressed on time and, and rushing Sharpening. through. Sharpening. Sharpening is a tough one because that's really a hands-on thing. But I can give you some basics and what to look for and what to get. Um, right size files. Right size files. A lot of the bars and the chain boxes will tell you exactly what file you'll need. So I already have that matched up. And this is a gauge. And on the gauge, it'll give me your angles. They're telling you, like I said, a chip chain is going to have a 45 degree. A chisel is going to have a 30 degree. Another thing is going to be on a lot of these, I don't know about the some other saws, but like steel and husky and that, there is a line on that tooth that you can match up. That's the angle you want to stay with. That's also the marker that's saying that there's 20% less of this tooth time to get rid of this chain. So you want to always stay in that same. And with you guys, you want to have the exact same number of strokes. Say I, I ding one side of the saw and I have to do five strokes on that side, I have to turn it around and do five strokes on the other side. And if you're getting really, really technical, you probably want to get a bench grinder because that's almost like a factory edge putting back on that. It's a lot of work to figure out how to use it, but once you do, you can really zip through it. And it's basically setting a cutting wheel that'll just do that angle. You move it around the entire as you go. You know, you're going to be the wheel, boom, boom, every time. It's going to do a perfect cut. It's almost going to be like factory. I even know guys that take chains out of the box and sharpen it. 
that amazed me the first time I saw it. But what I realized among of these guys, what they were doing was they're taking that depth gauge and doing an extra stroke or two on it so it's a little more aggressive. So where basically they can just basically put that saw on the wood, pull the trigger, and they don't even have to. They're not forcing it. That thing is literally pulling into the wood and just the weight of the saw will cut. If you have to force it or if it's pushing out, you know, sawdust that you would get on like one of your van saws or a, a homeowner's like um, carpentry saw, then you definitely need to sharpen that thing up. I have a question on the electric sharpener. I have an electric sharpener. And every time you sharpen the chain, the uh, tooth, it, it gets hot and it gets dark when you sharpen it. Is that a problem? I guess you, taking out you might take some strength out of it by reheating it like that. I would think so. Every time you sharpen Do you need a new grinding bit? Maybe that's what, maybe your bits. No, it's, it's a I'm not, for, I'm not, I don't, I'm not familiar with them. I've always just freehanded them. Oh, you use a, I just use this. Use no, I just use, I don't even use the grinder anymore. Yeah, some of these size. I do a lot of the same. Yeah. Well, he's probably also doing them. I don't know. They could have them. The machine. I wish I had one of those in my garage. Yeah, he sets it up and, and plugs in what it is, and it just. No, it's a it's a full size machine. You hang it in there, and then you crank it open, and it's got all these little wheels that are grinders that come out and do everything. Beautiful. Yeah, it's yeah, it's advancing the chain while it's making all its cuts. You know, it'll and then you know it'll do the other side by just putting out another wheel. If you take a real light cut, you're still going to get a little heat. Sure. And the chain's going to get dark. Sure. And I'm wondering if it depends on the grinder you use. Uh, if, if this factory grinder doesn't do that, it, it, it is set up so that it does not heat up the chain. I, I think so too. He might be a new bit. I'm thinking you might need a new a new bit, a new grinding bit. Like I said, I I thought these things were sharp until I get a new one, and then I'm like, okay, that one was dull. It's a one was worthy. Same with these guys. You only depending on how much how often you use them. That's a Sure. I took my chains to an uh, established place, and they were fairly new chains. And they came back; they were all blue. Every tooth on them was blue, so and they ground the whole batch of the tooth out. I went up to room level equipment, just like getting them out of a out of a brand new box. So it's a difference of the equipment too. Sure. And just know that those machines are probably going to take a little more metal than what you would do naturally by hand. If you're just pointing the saw up, my hand is perfect. Because you only need two or three strokes to point it up. You know, and then every couple of ones of those point ups, that's when you want to put the other gauge on it. And you'll literally stick it on top of there. And it'll, that depth gauge will stick out through this gap. And you just run a couple strokes over it until you stop hearing that grind. And then usually what I do after that is that I take that off and I do one more just for giggles and make it a little more aggressive, but not overly aggressive. But it's not a bad thing to take off. Ronald well, Man had a bench grinder, and he would never use it because he says it takes off too much metal. But when I had a saw that you hit a nail or something that really dings it, you're never going to get that perfect again by hand. I can adjust it where it takes off just a very, very, very small fraction. Sure, but it's still, you'll see it. You'll actually see it. Not the smaller bars, but when I was like the 32, when I get 24 inches and bigger, I can't freehand them. I can point them up a little bit, but once they get dinged, I have to take them to get go get sharpened on a machine. Because there's just too many teeth. It could be 130 teeth that I got to sharpen. And there's no way I'm going to have all those perfect. So I'll go take them because that chain's seventy-five dollars. It's not worth pitching it because I can't. And it's got you know three quarters of its tooth left on there still. It's worth paying 
you know, eight to 12 bucks to go get it sharpened and have it perfect again. How far do you go down on your teeth? How far do I go? It, there's a line on the tooth. There's a mark on the tooth that'll tell you when it stopped. I've passed them a few times, but when you start seeing the when the teeth disappear, it's time. But usually about 20%, because after that they start getting hot and it gets weaker, and you don't want that piece of shrapnel coming out at you. But I, I've I've worn them out. I usually and like an old chain, I'll keep those around to just sharpen up, just to. No, I'm putting it in a rotten piece of wood that's full of dirt in the middle or, you know, a stump ball or something. I know it's not going to. Yeah. Yeah. I know I'm going to hit dirt and, you know. Absolutely. Go ahead. Anybody. Don't stand over top of it. Don't stand like here. <laughs> um, the big thing on those, like you guys got to understand that there's pressure wood. It's hard for me to explain the physics of that. But if a tree is leaning over onto something and you cut down through the top of it, it's going to close in as you're cutting. It wants to generally fall to the ground. So your cut would actually be from the bottom up, making sure that that tip is all the way in there and not you're using just the tip of the no-go zone. You want to be as deep as you can and usually try to get, I try to start on an angle and then work the blade on strike underneath it and that's the one cut I'll come straight up with. And then go, when I get to the top, start going a little easier because you don't want to have that thing come out, catch a piece of wood and really throw it at you. So even stuff that's pressurized, you're going to have branches are going to be the worst. That's going to be the most dangerous because when those things are loaded up and they're bent, I always make little cuts behind, uh, not in that spot, but around that area. I'll make a couple cuts to alleviate some of that pressure, and you'll literally see the branch start to straighten out. And then you can, when it starts getting pretty close, then you can finish it off. But you don't want to just make one cut and have that thing just let loose. So you're talking about if it just falls over and you know there's pressure wood on there, but maybe the branches are holding up, there's some root holding it. I've cut trees that are, you know, I've had a pole 30 feet long where I cut down here thinking I'm going to work back into the stump, and all of a sudden the whole tree stands back up. So come down to the other side and just make that one cut. Sure. Sure. It's also good to something else, take another, like a limb, and stick it under there so when it does cut it, it's falling on that. It's not, you don't have to keep cutting towards the dirt. Because that's, like I said earlier, the biggest thing is keeping that saw sharp, keeping it out of the dirt. You don't want to be laying cable with your saw. It's not a ditch witch, you know. So anytime you can use like a cant hook or like a timber jack where you, it's like a cant hook that has a, another rod on the end of it. So it just, it props the wood up. Try to get them off the ground as much as you can. If you can't get it up, roll it over to finish your cut. And that way you're not putting that saw on the ground as much as possible. Any stump cut, you're going to, anything within that root flare, it is definitely going to have dirt, rocks, anything inside that tree. Because as it grows, it just grabs that stuff. So knowing that your, your final cut at the basal flare, the root flare, is going to be your dirtiest cut. And you guys shouldn't even have to worry about cutting that, that stump because you're not using it anyway. No, we're trying to get the stump. Oh, you're trying to get that for a lot of different. <laughs> I figured you guys want the straight stuff. We'll take it all. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I have some cards if anybody wants to call and ask other questions or anything along the way.